Hey and welcome to this video. If it's your first time here, my name is Lachlan Rousen. I'm Raf. And we are Australia's number one health and fitness podcast, The Mind Muscle Project. So, if you're here, what you can expect from us in the future is... Well, we interview the biggest names in fitness on Mondays. We've had Matt Fraser, Brent Fikowski, Pat Bell, not pretty much all the boys. On Wednesdays, uh, we talk about our athletic experience in our mid to early 20s. We've been to regionals multiple times. We talk about the most current and the most exciting new stuff in our industry. And on Fridays, on the podcast, we delve into fitness business. So we've started three gyms ourselves, and we talk about where we want to go with them, how we're doing it, and how to succeed in the fitness industry. So if you want to see more from us in the future, more exciting content, interviews, we've got heaps of stuff. You can go to the links below. We've got our website. We've got the top 10 most downloaded podcasts of all time. You guys will really enjoy those. And we've got plenty more content on our Instagram, so go there as well. And if you like videos, subscribe to the YouTube channel down below. Makes us want our own studio. Should be done soon. All right, cool. All right, my muscle I can't project. Really hear it anyways, no. Oh, you can't hear it. Oh, perfect. Um, all right, my muscle project. Welcome back to another episode. Today, we have on Armand Hammer, former guest. He's uh, was on episode ninety six with Scott when we were in LA in our podcast tour in two thousand and sixteen. Mm. Two thousand sixteen, yeah. And um, as you know, if you listened to that episode back then, Armand is uh, was the host of the Wildcast podcast. Still is, I believe, of the Wildcast yeah. podcast and uh, a few other different podcasts as well. But you know, really the main thing that um, is getting traction these days is, you know, re- Armin reporting on CrossFit News. Someone said it pretty accurately. He's like, he's like the Ariel Hawani of the CrossFit world now. He's like everywhere and like he's in all these places at once reporting on the news like as mm. the second break. So probably what's going to happen in the future is he'll leak some news that he wasn't supposed to leak, that he got information of. Oh, he's getting ahead fired of time. for sure. <laughs> and then Greg, and then, 100%. And then Greg Glassman kicks him out of every CrossFit Games event again. <laughs> How has he even lasted this long in the miracle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, hey, he's all with Greg, so you, you never know what's going to happen. But uh, um, welcome back to the show and uh, thank, thanks for being back on. Dude, I'm so glad to be here. I'm really pumped. Um, I'm really pumped. Good. Thanks for having good. me. We, um... We know there's obviously been a lot of changes in CrossFit and uh, we've, we've talked about some of them and, um, you know, they've, they've been quite a, a bit of a shock um, and some people have kind of gone one way saying it's a good thing and other people have gone back saying it's, you know, it's not a good thing. Uh, we're kind of a bit torn. There's obviously some aspects which are good and some aspects which are bad, but uh, we're interested to get, you know, just your general thoughts as to whether you think CrossFit taking money out of the games and putting it into the affiliates is, uh, is a good thing um you know just from your perspective of you know the sport and then you know just growing crossfit um just as a as a household name yeah that's a good that's a good question i think um you know i think a lot of people overreacted when it was first announced what was going on i think the fact that it kind of came from a third party uh from from justin with the morning chalk up and from from myself and like you know whatever whoever else was reporting on it um I think that threw people for a loop and the fact that there weren't any details and all this stuff is kind of just seems to be happening off the cuff, which it kind of is. It really put people in like a strange position. And, and you know, I, I think people's first initial reaction was just colored by that more than the actual content itself. So as we've been getting more information, I think, I think hopefully people have been looking at it with a little bit more of a, um, you know, unbiased I, you know, I think, I think people were very attached to the open to regionals, regionals, the game format. So, you know, now that, like you said, there's, there's this shift away from spending all of this money on the CrossFit games format and the season and controlling it uh, and moving that money into growing the affiliate presence internationally. To me, that's a positive thing and it can only be a positive thing. Um, You know, I, I think the games are, not um they're not going to die by changing their format if anything the change was inevitable um you know you guys know as well as i do how tough it is to run an affiliate and you also know how how like very little of the crossfit games really trickles down into what we do on a day-to-day basis Mm. so it was i think it's disingenuous for people to attribute CrossFit's like massive success um, and the affiliate model and its success to what the games were doing. Um, you know, the games were great marketing, but I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure they were really moving the needle day to day and across the gym. Mm. Yeah. It seemed like the, 
people that it would attract that would come in and be like, you know, I watched, um, you know, Rich Froning 4 and The Fittest on Earth and all that sort of stuff were people that were already into fitness and they're just kind of looking for the next level. Um, whereas you don't really get the person off the street who hasn't exercised in a long time to be like, you know, I'm trying to get in shape. What should I do? I should go to a CrossFit gym like that. I think the games really did a good job of killing that person because in the beginning, there was that person. Mm. That person was like, oh, I've heard this CrossFit thing, like gets you into shape, you eat paleo, et cetera, et cetera, lose a lot of weight. But then like the games got really big, you know, in like uh, 2010, 11, 12, and then people just started going, this is way too hardcore for me. So it seems like they're going to have to backtrack now and maybe undo some of the, you know, perception that they built with the games to try and get the lay person into CrossFit, which seems like the easiest way to do that is in South America right now. Yeah. You know, I, I agree. I think there was definitely, you know, the, the way that the games kind of trickled into and was represented in everyday gyms, I felt was actually kind of unhealthy. You know, I, I felt like so many people started focusing on like, I need to prep for the open. I got to train for the open all year round and I have to be ready for the, and it's like, why are you training for the open? Like, you know, you're not going to make it to regionals. So it's like, you know, if you're going to be training for the open, that's fine. But you're talking about like a five week period in the early part of the year that really doesn't correlate with much more than like how good you are at that moment in the sport of CrossFit. If there's a million other things you could be focusing on that are actually going to have much more, you know, uh, uh, meaningful effects on your day to day life, you know, whether it's you're improving your sleep or you're you know, improving your movement quality or what you're eating, like all those things are, are are significantly and obviously better things to focus on. They're just not as sexy as your open ranking. Mm. And so I think it was, it, it, it was represented in the everyday CrossFit gym sometimes in a really unhealthy way because people felt like, you know, if you're starting off, it felt like the goal was, oh, I have to train as if I'm going to be good at this competitively. As if like, if you started playing like a beer league softball with your buddies that you're going to train to go into like the major league baseball, you know, be a professional baseball player. Right. And the other way it was unhealthy was like people who, you know, CrossFit for like two or three years and like that early shine starts wearing off a little bit. And you're like, man, I haven't PR in, you know, like seven months. I don't know what's going on. Uh, Maybe I just need to like have like a harder training session. And it's like, okay, well now instead of training like five or six days a week, you're training like, five or six days a week and three of those are two a days and then like you know nine months down the road if you've survived you're like okay well i guess i'm going to keep doing seven days a week i'm going to add active recovery and three (laughs) four of those days are going to be two days and then it's like a year down the road if you've survived you're like well i'm just going to keep adding in volume it's like why why are you putting in like this like the wheel gets bigger and bigger the fitter you get and it's harder and harder to move it and at a certain point, like you have enough to live the life you want to live. Like, why do you just spend more and more time to try and move that wheel one more notch? Like, mm. what's the point? So that I think was an unhealthy result of how the CrossFit Games were represented in affiliates. Um, and I think this sort of like clean break of you don't have to do this unless you really want to be a professional here, unless you really want to develop in this sport. I think it's going to be, is going to be good. And you mentioned South America is like, you know, Brazil is the second largest grouping of affiliates uh, outside of the U S and I don't know if a lot of people are aware of that. And I think that that's really telling about where CrossFit is going. Mm. I I think the key, one thing I think for us as well is like the best bit is now that it's pretty much impossible to qualify. And I remember back in the day when it was like 60 people and all these teams, it was almost like if you did cross it for a year, you couldn't help but qualify to go to regionals on a team. Like mm-hmm. we know people that were still really overweight and had just started their fitness journey and were like going to regionals. Mm-hmm. But now it's like, sweet, nobody is making it like every other sport. Like I'm not making it. No one's making it. No one you know is making it. And it's like finally <laughs> over. And that's like where it needs it's to finally over. everyone to give up. <laughs> it's like, it's finished. There's like one person that qualifies now. I don't even know who that's going to be. For sure he's going to be on steroids. No, it's not going to be at this gym. And that's how it is in every other sport. Yeah, I mean, you know, there was always the feeling of, you know, the fittest person you know can like sniff regionals, mm. you know, if like everything works out in their in their favor. And now it's like the fittest person that the fittest person you know knows has no fucking <laughs> shot of making it. <laughs> 
<laughs> None. Like you, yeah. the the regular CrossFitter has never met and will never meet a CrossFit Games athlete now, mm. which is awesome. Yeah. Like, yeah, what, what, what more could you ask for? Like, if you're looking at the elite of the elite, that's a good way of doing it. Mm. Yeah, it's like um, I don't know who it was I can't remember his name. <sighs> no, Ricky Garrard. No, no, no. no. <laughs> He's, he's long gone. <laughs> no, this kid's way younger. And uh, someone showed me the other day. They're like, oh, check out this, this CrossFit kid or whatever. And like, this is like the legit new generation. Like, you know, obviously when we were competing or trying to compete, we're like, you know, Wes, like the next generation is going to be insane. But the next generation hadn't really stepped up. And now the new generation is here. You know, the new generation that starts off, he comes into the gym and, you know, fucking Maxwell Hags is coach. Ben Bergeron's his mental coach. He's got deadlifting training off you know um jim wendler or some shit and he like moves perfect and he's got a gymnastics background and this kid he's not even like 20 and he's doing front squats 185 kilos and he's like fran times like a minute 30 and i'm like okay so now this kid on his instagram highlight reel is better than every australian crossfitter that i know i'm like we are in the new era of the sport anyone that is over like 25 and isn't doing anything close to this kid that's it like it's it's time it's time to wrap it up. Like CrossFit's sending you a pretty clear message that we only want kids like this in the future. Um, I actually had a question. Yeah. Do you know anyone that you know is that sort of regionals level? Maybe has done gone to the games once, kind of dabbling in the. Am I in? Am I out? Do I have one or two more years left? That has kind of gone. You know what? This is my way out, or this is you know it hasn't given me what I wanted, and it's not the professional wage or fulfilling as it used to be. And it's kind of now been the, the reason for them to step out of the sport. Um, yeah, I think, I think I know of at least a handful of athletes um, that have been to the games in the past couple of years who are, are, you know, on the fence in the retirement side of things, right. They're, they're sort of realizing that like, Oh, this was like, I, they're, they're realizing like I never was a professional athlete. Like I, I was just a really good hobbyist and I sacrificed a lot in order to make this happen, but it was never really sustainable. And I think that's what they're starting to realize. Um, you know, I think because of how the team format has changed, we're going to see a lot of the same people that we have been seeing, but now on the team side. And I think that's a really good thing. That's a good way of getting the, the team athletes or like the individual athletes who just aren't going to cut it to come into the team side of things and actually show up and, you know, be able to compete and, you know, make maybe some sort of a wage doing this, you know, if they do well enough at these events or get sponsors to, to pay for their way through these events, you know, I think that's entirely possible, but for sure, man, I mean, this is, this is a wake up call. It really is a wake up call for a lot of people to realize like, Oh man, like I'm not Cara Webb. I'm not Matt Fraser. Like in the U.S., imagine, dude. Matt Fraser lives here. There are, there are seven thousand affiliates. Like like sixty five percent, if not more, of the CrossFit Games athletes on the individual side from, were from the states. Mm. Matt Fraser is going to take the one spot. Like, what do you do if you're <laughs> anybody else in this country? You know what I mean? Like, you have to be asking yourself that question. Like, like, listen, I love Cole Sager. Cole Sager's a great athlete. He, he usually qualifies for the games by the skin of his teeth. And then at the games, he does really well. How is Cole Sager going to qualify? He's never won one of those other events. Now he has to go win Wadapalooza? Are you kidding me? Like, how is that even going to happen? So, like, that is one of those moments where, like, this guy is, like, perpetual top 10. He's going to have to step it up in some way if he wants to keep doing this professionally. Like, Cole is a different example because he has a whole thing that he does, you know, outside of just being an athlete. But just in terms of, like, think of that caliber of athlete. Like there are, excuse me, there are athletes in like the top 10 at the games who seriously should be considering retiring or going team. Mm. Otherwise they may never make it back. Mm. Yeah. It's almost like that. Um, it's like uh, having like a business, like a gym, for example, because that's probably one of the most common businesses that these athletes have is kind of like having a degree like a really good degree, like a law degree or an accounting degree or I don't know, medical degree or something. And it's like, no, nah, I'm just going to go like follow my passion and like do finger painting. And, and now you fall back to your degree. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you get that degree, bro. <laughs> that's, that's what it's like. But then there's like, 
it seems like there's a lot of athletes now that are like, oh shit, I didn't get a degree. And they're like, mm, they're fucked because they gave up so much of their like important professional career life, right? When you're in your mid to late twenties to early thirties, that's where you have a lot of energy and you have a lot of opportunities. You know, you don't have like a partner necessarily or like a big mortgage or whatever, and you don't have all this extra stuff to tie you down. You can work really hard and, and build your, your career up, but they spent all their time training. And now it's like this weird position where I think for them, it would make them feel pretty bitter about, and you know, we know a lot of these people personally, um, you know, a lot of them have been to regionals tons and tons of times and have done really well. And now it's kind of like CrossFit just kind of, you know, just cut the cord. They're just like, sorry, that's it. It's, uh, it's over. And it, it all happened pretty quickly. When you spoke to Greg, what was the feeling that you got from him about the whole situation? Um, you know, I think he was, is excited about it for various reasons. Obviously, it's his idea, so he must be really excited about it. Mm. But the general, the general feeling that I got from him was that he's been thinking about this for years. I mean, since at least 2010, 2011. Like, 2011 was the open, and that was his idea. He, was, he, he essentially came out and said, hey, guys, we can't run – a thousand sectionals. There's no way we'd be able to sustain that. Uh, we have to come up with a way of, of doing like an online leaderboard that people can just participate in as the first round. And then what was sectionals and regionals turned into the open and regionals? Well, this is his call as well. You know, he's basically looking at it and saying, guys, we can't, we can't be in a situation where we constrain the competitive season into just regionals that that we as CrossFit HQ control, it's unsustainable from a sport perspective and it's unsustainable from a business perspective. There has to be a change. I think for him, the icing on the cake is that one, it uh, makes the CrossFit model as a business much more successful immediately. It just pushes the affiliate model and the seminars into countries that that maybe right now are like dipping their toes in the water, mm. but in the future are going to be, you know, just trying to swim in that lake as much as possible. Mm. And then the second thing it does, which was really interesting to me was, uh, and probably the thing he was most interested in and most excited about was like, it's going to be fun to watch again. And that was a really interesting critique to hear from Greg Glassman yeah. because you know, he's always been, uh, like, he doesn't, he doesn't really care about the games. Like, the games hasn't really been his focus. And he has had the same experience at the CrossFit Games that so many of us have, like, going and watching or just watching online. And you're like, what the hell is going on? Like, why are there 400 people here on this team event? Some people are on stretchers. Who's <laughs> in like who's in the lead? Like what the hell is happening? Right. Or like, you know, even he even pointed out, he was like, he was like, I remember watching, he's like, I was watching the team event and I had no idea who any of these people were, which is fine. But he's like, I was the only person watching. And I was looking around. He's like, there's no one else here. He's like in the stadium at the CrossFit game. Like there's no one else here watching who's supposed to be the best CrossFitters in the world. Why are we doing this? Like, what's the point of doing this? Because, and then we have the teens and the masters and they've been like sequestered in this pavilion for the past three years that no one goes to. <laughs> Sam Briggs competed and Anna Tobias competed in, at the same time against one another in one of like the craziest head to head battles in the masters division ever. And 14 people watched it. Like it just wasn't experienced. And he's like, why are we doing this? Like who cares that was another thing. Like, you know, Greg Glassman is very uh, blunt in case you haven't ever figured that out from like yeah. listening to him speak, but yeah. he's very blunt. And he was like, I don't care who takes 32nd at the CrossFit games. I mean, all that matters is who's number one, two, and three. It's like the podium is what we care about. We just want to know who's the best. Mm. And he's like, if, if we change the games and it changes who would have been like 25th and maybe they would be 28th or maybe they would be like 18th. He's like, I don't care. That doesn't matter. It's like, we shouldn't be watching them anyway. Like, at the CrossFit Games, we have four heats, and three of them don't matter. 
I was like, yeah, you're hundred percent right. It's really fucking boring, man. Like, yeah. like you're watching the same, it's a slog. You get to you watch the same things over and over again. So like in a weird way, I, I think this, this change, it affects so many things so positively that the, the overall outcome is going to be a net positive. There are going to be growing pains, but like it's going to be more exciting to watch. You're going to have a better competition at the top end, and you're going to have you know, more recognition for the best of the best. And I think that in and of itself is, is worth it. So you know, the rest of it is just, is just bonus. Mm. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Coming back to you saying it's like a better business model for CrossFit overall, obviously part of that was the, the cost cutting and the laying off of a ton of media stuff. I'm sure you probably knew a couple of those people personally. Now they just contract out to Armit. Do you notice? Armit's <laughs> 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 way cheaper. Yeah, way cheaper. I'm free. I, I, do, I, do, it, I do it for no money. Zero dollars. That's okay. That's okay. He's got you on call. Um, how, how was, what was their general feeling about it? Because obviously maybe Greg's not, you know, as... Um, maybe transparent day to day as what they were thinking. You know, he's probably not thinking 2011, Hey media team, uh, just so you know, I'm thinking I'm probably going to cut this whole thing in maybe like five to six years. So like, <laughs> don't get too excited about your job. Um, how, how are some of their reactions, you know, without naming names about, obviously it probably felt, well, it felt sudden for us, you know, I'm sure it felt sudden for them as well. Um, what was the kind of general vibe there? Did they see it coming? Was it um, expected or was it just, you know, completely out of shock? Um, it was, I think it's fair to characterize it as completely unexpected. Mm -hmm. Um, essentially the, you know, there was closed door meetings with a handful of people about what direction the games were going to be moving in as early as, you know, before the games this year. Um, but those closed door meetings didn't include, um, pretty much anybody that, that is like a big player right now. And so what basically happened was they just pulled everyone in the room together and said, Hey, this is what's, this is what's going on. Uh, and, and that even might be a mischaracterization because it really was more like pulling everyone in a room together and saying, Hey, you guys are all out of a job. We're moving in a different direction and focusing on CrossFit health. And then a week later was the news about what they were doing to the CrossFit games. Mm. So there was like a 10 day gap in there. Um, where it really just wasn't clear, you know, the change that was going to the CrossFit games, it was, it was kind of hinted at with how they laid people off. You know, they, he kind of decimated the, the media teams specifically attached to the CrossFit games and uh, the organizational team around regionals. And so it's like, okay, well that tells us something is going on. Um, but there's no way they're going to blow up the entire CrossFit game season. Like, they're probably just, you know, consolidating and maybe giving some people like extra responsibility. And then like 10 days later, he's like, yeah, regions are gone. We're done. It's over with like, this is it. And so those, those rumors were starting to come out, but it caught everybody off guard, including, you know, Dave Castro and uh, Justin Berg. Like they, they didn't know Justin Berg was on vacation mm. um, when, when Greg Glasser made that announcement and uh, Dave was not around either. And so they were both caught off guard um and they're you know they're the guys who are respond like directly responsible for the execution and planning of the crossfit games so you know i, I think this was uh, a unilateral decision by greg lastman it caught a lot of people um by surprise and it's like a good way of summing up sort of what the vibe was was i, I ran into um one of the guys who was who was laid off who's who's been with crossfit forever and has been like either behind or on camera for most of their stuff. And he was like, uh, I ran into him at Granite Games and he was like, like, so, you know, you're, it's like, I really love watching your stuff. Like, you know, I'm learning more about what I was laid off for from you than I, than I did from, <laughs> from what they told us. And I was like, fuck dude i'm sorry like i don't know what to say to that like i'm so sorry like like you're getting paid to be here at least like i don't know like, like yeah. you're still making money doing this like you know so I, I don't know i don't know what the overall feeling is you know i, I know that i reached out to a couple people who were in the know immediately after the layoffs happened 
um, while it was still kind of like nobody was talking about what was going on and sort of got like a rough confirmation that things were going to change in a really dramatic way and that things were going to be really difficult. And uh, that, that, that guy's still involved with CrossFit. Um, but he's like a huge nerd. He's like a big fan of it the same way that all of us are. And he was like, yeah, man, it's tough. Like things are going to be never the same again. Like we have, we have like officially eclipsed of an era of the CrossFit games. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I've been telling everyone that had their first year at regionals. I was like, you are so lucky you got it in when you got it in because like, yeah, you were a part of that time in 10 years where I was like, oh my God, you did the regionals. It's like, what was that like? You know? So, yeah. Yeah. Man. It was pretty. And it's gonna be forever in the Instagram bio. <laughs> <laughs> Four <times>. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, people won't even know what it fucking means yeah. in, in ten years. What the fuck's regionals? Um, what do you uh, What do you hope that happens with the upcoming sanctioned events? Obviously, quite a few of them have been announced. Um, not a whole lot of events internationally yet. Uh, maybe you can fill us in on some of those international ones. But wh- is there like a general expectation from CrossFit? What are they sort of um, setting as guidelines for the event are they going to have a presence there they're going to write the workouts what's what's sort of the general vibe that um crossfit wants from these events that's a great question um and i think people will be very surprised by the answer to that question it's it's essentially imagine if instead of asking about sanctioned events you're asking about what happens inside of an affiliate the answer is the same crossfit could not care less like they have zero say Like they don't want to impose anything about what's going on at these events, the same way that they don't impose what happens within an affiliate. Mm. The uh, sanctioning agreement is mainly for um, safety reasons. So essentially what the sanctioning agreement does is it brings the event under CrossFit's doping uh, rules. And it also brings the event under CrossFit's like organizational safety rules. So things like a certain number of medical doctors, you know, ADs and, you know, having ambulances ready, having procedures in place, being insured um, in case of injuries or accidents. And uh, it's really interesting to think like the main thing that um, the main thing that that Greg pointed to was like, listen, man, and he sounded really torn up over it um, when I was talking to him. He was like, if we had done this, six or seven years ago, Kevin Ogar would still be walking. Fuck. And I was like, I was speechless. I was like, I can't, I honestly, it's crazy to me that that has made such a big impact on his life that he still is thinking about this to this day. He's like, if we had done this and imposed, if we had embraced these outside events and helped them with their logistics, Kevin Ogar would still walk today. Like he never would have gotten injured because the the layout, like, uh, you know, it was the environment part of the, part of the thing that hurt him was the fact that like there were plates behind him and like, you know, it, it bounced off the plates and hit him. And so if he had just been able to like safely bail and the plates weren't behind him, mm. then he wouldn't, he probably wouldn't have been injured as severely. And so, uh, that's, that was like one thing that he like directly pointed out. He's like, listen, man, like we can prevent injuries like this just by, just by being better at planning, just by being better prepared in case of emergencies. And so I think the sanctioning relationship with the events has nothing to do with the programming. They are not going to try and control the programming, whether it's the qualifiers, whether it's the actual events, some of the events are two days, some of the events are four days, you know, some of the events are, are invitational heavy. Some of the events are only qualifiers. And so they have no, they're giving no control over this. Mm. The, they're, the only relationship they're getting is really this relationship of like, you know, you and your athletes have to use the CrossFit doping policies. We have standards in place that we've learned from all the regionals and the games of like best practices when it comes to, you know, making events safe uh, for the competitors. And then from that point on, they're just like, there are a couple little details about how uh, the CrossFit Games sponsors interact with the events and stuff. But all of that is very vague. It's all very like, um, it's like, oh, we'll, we'll figure that out down the road type stuff. Like they just kind of like put it into the contracts, but none of it has been, has been really muscled until, into, into where it should be, I think. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I think for one man in particular, for Dave Castro, 
he is now faced with the most interesting scenario because he controlled every single rep that every, every rep. single athlete did leading up to stepping into the, the Madison, right? And now he's just being sent a bunch of different athletes that have qualified all different ways. And now he has one program to obviously give them to see who's the fittest on earth. But before it was like, you know, they're the fittest on earth because I've put them through X amount of workouts. I put them through this open stuff. I put them through this regional thing and, and they're proven. So it's interesting that all these athletes will be coming to him now and he's had very little control of how, or it seems like zero control as to how they've got there. So now they're just proven to be from small countries where it's easy to qualify. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 But I'll be, I'll be curious think- to see what events people will qualify through like will someone just qualify and they will have never maybe they haven't lifted over 140 kilos you know maybe they, they could pop 100 pounds you know it's crazy yeah i think i think that's i think that's entirely possible um i think dave castro's job in some ways gets easier and in some ways gets much more interesting uh yeah. you know i can't imagine it gets much harder because of these changes but now you know his open programming is um you know it's still going to be the big test that most of the qualifiers are going to be using and i don't know how they're going to try and like they have to put some sort of minimum work requirement like they have to say oh you you know in order to qualify out of zanzibar you have to be able to do like all the minimum rx workouts right so like you might get someone who doesn't finish a workout you know, or like, but just barely meets the minimum work requirements qualifying. But at the same time at the games, uh, because they have so many athletes going to the games, they're going to really dramatically cut the field down over the first few days. And I think that is like fine. So they kind of have like a mini regionals esque style where they just like cut down the field by half every event basically. But the cool thing is that the plan is to only have one heat it's like one heat of men, one heat of women, one heat of teams, and that's it. Like those are that is all that is going to happen the last few days of the games. So now imagine the bandwidth that Castro has to program a test of fitness when he only has to test the ten best males and the ten best females in the world. Like we can see things that we've never seen before because before he'd have to like write something that you know, some variation can be done with the 40th fittest team of six mm. in the world. Like, who the fuck are those people? Like, why? You know what I mean? So, like, that's the, the idea is, like, by having that type of a very, very thin slice of the competitive pie to deal with, he's going to have a lot of bandwidth to do really cool stuff that he's never done before. Mm. And hopefully he does. I have no idea, but I hope so. It'll be interesting to see as well just how he cuts on the first. Because obviously he's going to be very careful to you know not cut Matt Fraser. Um, <laughs> but like it's not easy when you have 160 athletes. If you're shredding yeah. really hard, everyone has bad workouts. Yeah, you're right. I think uh, I think you know there's I don't know there's a million ways for him to do it. Um, I imagine it's going to be something like what we saw, um, like the first. Th- you know, I think you could take like the first couple days of like the first day of regionals, for example, from pretty much any of the last three or four years and run 200 athletes through it. And that will pretty much tell you who's going to win, much less, you know, who the best are. Right. And so I think after being able to sort of like cut down with like, you know, one or two events, like even this year, the games, the first two or three events of the games was pretty much enough to know who's going to make it mm. like you have the cyclocross into the total into 30 muscle ups for time. And you're like, okay, well that pretty much covers everything. Like all that's left is like muscle ups and, and like clean and jerk. So, um, you know, I, I guess, I guess the, they can find like a series of two or three tests. I think it would just be really cool if they did like, you know, one of the girl workouts or two or three of the girl workouts and just called it based off of that. Like that would pretty much round out the, the, uh, the way of, of, of making like cuts throughout the athletes without, mm. without really missing anything. I think. I think it makes for a um, more exciting, like media, like a media story as well, because you know, when they try and tell the story on Netflix or whatever, generally most people are a bit butthurt because it's like, man, he was coming in third or fourth all weekend. And you interviewed him once. He's like, now they can really be like, here are the 10 men, here are the 10 women, like here are their stories. And like, let's see them mm. battle it out. And I think it'll make for a more interesting 
like just a more interesting show in general. It's like, oh, what, what's that documentary about? Oh, yeah, it's like about you know, the fittest on earth and you know, the cross of games and stuff. And instead, now it's going to be all oh, the 10 fittest men and the 10 fittest women and whatever the teams are, are going yeah. to battle it out you know, over three days. And it's like the most insane battle against the top 10 in the world. That's a, that's just, a cool story. Agree. I 100% agree. I, I feel like the biggest problem with most of the media that has been coming out, like the documentaries that have been coming out with, through CrossFit uh, about the games, is that it's about the games, but literally about the games. Like it, it's about the event, not about the people or the competitors. Like it's almost like they're doing a recap of the games. It's like who cares about a recap of the games? Like I can Google that. I can go on the Wikipedia page and I can see who won. Like, I want to know the story of the people who are participating in this. And I think by having only 10 athletes, you know, like in most professional sports in the world, you know, people who follow along can name five to 10 of the best athletes in that sport because you only really have to worry about five to 10 of the best athletes in that sport. You can name like two big teams, you know? So I think that is the, that's the sort of, magnification that is going to happen in the storytelling side of things um with this this type of a field of play mm. no it is it is going to be super interesting do you know if they're keeping it uh where the games is at the moment or if they're going to move it or they're going to downsize the amount of arenas they're going to use they uh they just re-signed with car uh not carson geez they just re-signed oh, uh, with Madison. So they're going to be there, I think, through uh, this year and next year. So 2019 and the 2020 games, I think, are, are, are confirmed in Madison. And Reebok is still around till 2020? Yeah, 2020 is the last year on the books of the Reebok relationship. Mm. What do you, where do you see that going? Because obviously they made an announcement they're going to maybe put less money into the sport as we've been discussing it's not necessarily a bad thing but maybe from Reebok's perspective they might not get as, as sweet of a deal potentially we don't really know yet um what do you think or what do you feel like is going to happen there and what have you sort of heard is going to happen um man I, I i don't know Reebok and CrossFit have a very weird relationship right like sometimes they're just like super buddy buddy and other times they're like they're like enemy it's like a very frenemy mm. they feel like like a bunch of sorority girls sometimes right. like one day they're best friends and the next day they're they're mortal enemies and uh i think if you remove that part of their relationship you actually kind of see that it's been really positive for both companies like majorly positive for both companies so I imagine that uh, that's my that's my dog. I don't know if you guys heard that. Uh, I imagine that um, you know both sides are are pretty pumped about continuing that relationship in some way or another. You know, I've heard some some different you know perspectives on that. Um, just like you and I, you know, we've been in this for a long time. We remember the pre-Bach days. You know, there's a lot of people still involved who feel that you know Reebok is not a positive influence and shouldn't be, you know, a title sponsor or shouldn't be like the only apparel and footwear at the games. And I, I don't really have a, I don't really have like a, a an opinion on that in, in one way or another. I think CrossFit, if it's able to grow to, you know, the size that the games has potential to grow to, I think that they could reasonably look at sponsors, title sponsors that are not an apparel company. You know, I, I imagine that they can, you know, you'll never have the Coca-Cola CrossFit games, although that'd be hilarious. Uh, you know, you can have more like mainstream brands, right? Brands that don't lock up, you know, and then, and then they can have contractual relationships with an apparel maker for like, oh, you're going to make the jerseys that everyone wears or, you know, but everyone gets to wear whatever shoes they want, but you're the official sock of CrossFit. Yeah. I mean, like, I think what they're really hoping to do is if they can grow to the point where they have more of like a big mainstream um, brand partners in different verticals, as opposed to just giving complete control of like one major, multiple major slices of their business to one company. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it seems like would make the most sense. I mean, if you look at any other, well, I've thought about this a lot, but if there's any other major sport out there, there is like, let's take ice hockey, for example, you got, different gloves sticks skates pads helmet 
and then the jersey. There's so many different potential sponsors there. And then if you think about the reach of each sponsorship, because, you know, if one athlete, if you take Matt Fraser, he's wearing four different brands. Every brand's going to promote the same picture, but they're going to call their item on Matt Fraser. And if each brand has 2 million followers, that's 8 million people instead of Reebok's 5 million people, you know? And so it's like, it makes, maybe CrossFit would get less money for that. But overall, I think the reach would be better because Reebok's reach is, you know, mediocre. That's probably the one thing that they, you know, aren't as strong at is sort of their marketing and their, their promotion and brand, which I think, like you said, it's been positive because CrossFit has really helped them out there as maybe not being reciprocated as much because they were kind of small and on the way out a little bit and it didn't have the best sort of image for a while. Um, whereas if they took on someone like Nike, for example, for shoes, like all athletes do Nike shoes, Nike has massive, massive reach. You know, if they're, if they're putting out pictures of shoes with CrossFit games on them, it's going to help a lot. And then, you know, Reebok can do the clothes, you know, and then stands can do the socks or whatever. So is, there's a lot of potential there. A lot of potential. I agree. Yeah. Um, Maybe they can bring back, what was the first sponsor? The Panda Chinese? Really good food. Yeah. Panda Express. Panda Express. Panda Express. Delicious. Post workout. The best Panda thing about Express. that sponsor is like, I've had that Panda Express shit, and that's the worst meal you could ever <laughs> have before a CrossFit workout. Like this greasy Chinese food, it just leaves you like you couldn't you couldn't create a more perfect food that would be worse during a workout. Yeah, <laughs> that makes you feel. Yeah, feel they definitely should bring Panda Express back or Taco Bell. It should be the Taco Bell CrossFit Games. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Um, and have you been to or were you in Madison last year or this year? Yes, I was there. I was there both years. We um we we got some heavy criticism from our audience because we uh, made a comment on the vibe of the games at Madison versus the vibe versus Carson. Cause we haven't actually been to Madison, but we had been to Carson. What are, how would you compare the two experiences um, at the games? That's a great question, man. Um, you know, the first year they were at Madison was a bit of a shit show. So 2017 was, was strange. Uh, a lot of really weird things went wrong. I think that's to be expected. It's a new venue, the new layout. They're not used to it. Um, I think overall, it's probably, I don't know, it's probably better overall. It's definitely better for CrossFit. Like it's way better for HQ. Um, for the average person involved in like being a spectator there, it might be a little bit worse. So overall, it's a little bit better, but for the average spectator, it's not as good. And the reason why it's not as good is the exact same reason why it's better for CrossFit. So like in Carson, Carson's a suburb of Los Angeles. Like LA, the you know major metropolitan area of LA has like 8 million people in it. It's one of the largest metropolitan areas in the States mm -hmm. um, and one of the largest in the world. And so you know, when you have an event like the CrossFit Games and it brings 45,000 people, maybe 35,000, 40,000 people to show up, that is literally a drop in the bucket. Like more people go to some, I guarantee you right now, there's some sort of like strangely specific anime convention <laughs> that has five times the amount of people 100%. that CrossFit has ever brought in. Like, like more people are are physically at that anime convention than have ever competed in the open. That's how popular big yeah. things are in those types of cities. And so when you talk about like 40,000 people showing up to watch people exercise, the city is like, cool, okay, like do whatever you want, but it's gonna take you, you know, three months to get this permitting and it's full price and, you know, we don't really care about you know, trying to help you out with anything. You're gonna have to pay all the overtime for the cops to come and be security. And, you know, you have to pay the lifeguards for your peer workout, whatever it is that you're, you're like morons are doing out there. Like, <laughs> no one cares. You know I mean, like, no one cares. Whereas in like Madison, the entire city rolled out like a red carpet. Like, mm -hmm. like restaurants were like, welcome to CrossFit Games fans. Here's our paleo menu. Or like, yeah, you know, uh, every street corner had signage. Uh, the hotels had like, big decals of the athletes like standing like holding a medicine ball or awkwardly right like like they have <laughs> like the entire city put out for crossfit in a way that that does not and could never happen in in los angeles right mm. 
So when, when CrossFit shows up and says, hey, your city is literally empty in the middle of the summer and we're going to bring 50,000 people to it and add X amount of dollars to your, to your tax revenue and sort of like bring all this business through like hotels and Airbnb and stuff. The city is like, awesome, bring it on. We're going to help you out. Like, what do you need? Do you need cops? Do you need logistical help? Do you need like, you know, licenses? Do you need permitting? We can do all of that immediately. Like whatever you're asking for done, don't worry about it. And so that is huge. Like the ability for CrossFit to lean on Madison is, is like a really big asset. And I don't know if they've even fully used it um, as much as they can. Like this past year, I think it was much better than it was previously in, in 2017. But uh, I think that is a big benefit for them. At the same time, what the hell is there to do in Madison? Mm. Like in Carson, you're 20 minutes away from everything in the world. Like you want to go to the beach? Awesome. You want to go do drugs on the beach? Awesome. You want to go watch movies next to movie stars? Easy to do. You want to go to the best restaurants in the world? Yeah. Also easy to do. Like you want to go to Disneyland? You can leave the CrossFit games and be at Disneyland in less than 30 minutes and then spend all day missing whatever boring affiliate <laughs> workouts were going on and then come back with your Mickey Mouse ears and sit in the crowd and watch someone do an event, right? Like you could do those things. Whereas like in Madison, like, do you want to, do you want to ride your bike? Do you want to like, do you want to eat cheese curds? Do you want to drink beer? Good beer. But like, do you want to drink beer all day long? Cause you can do that. And that's about it. Like that's the big difference for the spectators. Like, mm. you know, the way the CrossFit games was formatted is not really that spectator friendly. So like they had to do a lot more at the venue to try and make it more interesting and exciting for people to be there. I think they did a decent job at that. But at the, at the end of the day, like you're literally in the middle of Madison, Wisconsin. Like there is the airport is not prepared for the people that show up. It's a wow. very, it's like a small regional airport. Like every year at the games for the past two years at the games, you are guaranteed your flight is going to be delayed leaving Wisconsin. Oh wow. Like it's, it is a guarantee. <laughs> like you were walking through the airport on Monday after the CrossFit games is over it's like you're you're surrounded by the fittest, most inconvenienced people on the planet. Like they're all just like standing around, like fuck this place. Like, my, <laughs> like what the hell is going on? And you know, like it's it's really interesting moment in time to like look around and think, like man, like we're all just pissed at being like three hours late. But like, what are we even doing here? Like, what is, why are we all here right now? Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a, that's a weird place that Madison puts, puts the spectators in because it's really good for CrossFit and it so far hasn't been that it hasn't been like a huge benefit for the spectators really. So yeah, yeah I remember when we went to LA, it was like the spectacle of being in LA was like almost better than the games itself. So we were there for like what a week and a half. We skipped a lot of games. <laughs> yeah, and like, I remember, I remember <laughs> yeah. and we had like an awesome time. But if I think about where we had the awesome time, a lot of it was not necessarily at the CrossFit Games. There were highlights there, obviously, but there was so much extra stuff that we did. Like we did 26 podcasts mm. while we were there and we drove all over LA and saw so much cool shit and went to Venice, et cetera, et cetera. Went to all these iconic gyms. I can't imagine there'd be any podcast to do in Wisconsin and there'd be no iconic gyms to go to and there wouldn't be awesome you know, scenes to check out and, and places to eat necessarily. So I completely understand what you're saying. I think most people then would go there if they're making the effort to just be like, all right, we're going to go there. We're going to fly in on the Friday. If we miss the morning events, that's fine. But let's leave on the Sunday. It's not like, let's do a whole trip. You know, like Aussies aren't going to now travel necessarily all the way out if they're not supporting their guy. At least before it's like, oh, we'll go to Vegas. And then, yeah, and then we'll, we'll, well, road trip down to LA or vice versa. It was, there was stuff to do, but there's not really stuff mm. to do anymore. Like you go in there if you're the hardcore fan, which may decrease over time. Yeah. I mean, it's hard enough. Like I don't live very far in the grand scheme of things. I don't live very far from Madison, Wisconsin. Like it is a, uh, maybe like 1500 miles. Wow. So yeah. it's, it's like a four hour flight if there were direct flights, there are not direct flights. <laughs> That's like, like a bad I, yeah. 
I fly into I fly into either Chicago and take like a tiny little airplane that seats like 40 people the wow. hour long flight or the 40 minute flight over or you have to like fly into into Chicago and take a train or a bus not even a train sorry there are no train tracks either the bus oh, wow. from Chicago so it's like it's not an easy place to get into it's a, it's a very small airport to fly into and so um it's one of those things where for where the cross of games are at as a spectator event like i i would be shocked if you guys made it there mm. because it's it's one it's really expensive like it's very expensive it's like three or four times at least three or four times the cost for you guys just to get stateside much less getting to madison yeah and then on top of that like if you're if you're in the states like why do you want to be in madison wisconsin yeah. Go anywhere else. Like, go to Chicago. Go to New York. Go to Miami. Like, go to Wadapalooza instead of the games. You're going to have a much better time in Wadapalooza. Mm. So, like, I, I, that's the thing. Like, the, the locale is, is conducive to CrossFit and not super conducive for the spectators. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that is what was so good about L.A. It was like, we would just hang out all year for a deal flight to L.A. And that's the only airport we had to land in. And we could get there for, like, you know, a good time would be like 800 bucks, you know, Australian, which is like, I don't know, 500 US. And that would be sick. Like, that's perfect. Like, if we hang out all year for those tickets and we get there, like you said, not many people are going for those tickets. It's not like to the World Cup or whatever. They know that the, those dates are going to be, they're going to ramp them up all year. They'll, you'll get a deal if you, if you wait for it at the start of the year. But now I just can't see us doing it. It's just so, so far and not, like you said, not cheap. Like, it's, it's going to be that flight to LA plus the next flight plus this fucking wooden airplane. Man, I can't wait for the people to qualify out of Zambia to be like, where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> like, we're it's going so to so fucking States. inconvenient for them to go and then just Castro cut them within 25 minutes. <laughs> Send them straight back. Yeah. yeah, it's like, all right, first one, we're going to be doing like muscle up with a backflip. <laughs> just jog to the airport when you're the last one there, just go home. <laughs> There's a boat. There's a boat waiting for you on the lake. Everyone's got a free ride. It'll take you back to Africa. Yeah, it's it's. I 100% agree. I mean, I I I feel bad for some of the athletes who are going to qualify out of the as like a national champion, who like deservedly have earned their way to the CrossFit Games in this format, and then spend God knows how much money to actually make it. Cause it's like, listen, e even if you take something like, uh, like, you know, an athlete out of Britain, right. Let's say Sam Briggs, mm -hmm. Sam Briggs, let's say she wins her, her country and qualifies for the CrossFit games again. Sam is a professional athlete. She's won the CrossFit games before. She has plenty of sponsors and those sponsors are going to eat the cost of like $4,500 to get her to Madison. Mm -hmm. Not even talking about like, an Airbnb for a week, all the food, you know, flying, not just her, but also, you know, her, her physical therapist and like her mental coach or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Like you get what I mean? Like this isn't just one person. Like I feel bad for the countries who even having the opportunity to qualify and make it to the CrossFit games, even having like major airports and like a good infrastructure to get to the states it's absurdly expensive much less countries like you know zambia or whatever like fuck like i'm i don't know how they're gonna make it like how how many kickstarters can one person start, like have you know <laughs> what's gonna happen what is gonna happen like how do you kickstart twenty six thousand dollars to fly you from like you know central africa to fucking madison Wisconsin? Yeah. What what do you yeah. do yeah i just hope they have the thing like at the olympics where people come from like north korea or whatever and they arrive and then they run for it and they just stay in america <laughs> <laughs> like all these it happens that happens and yeah. uh, when the world championships for weightlifting happen in, in the states uh they have to be very very careful um you know athletes some athletes they they like parse through like years of their instagram social media like years of their posts and deny them visas because they have like insinuated in the past that they might defect their country. So they're like, you can't go. Sorry. Oh, like, wow. you, you can't go compete. And so, I mean, we already had like visa problems with Kretikov 
Like yeah. what, what's stopping visa problems with like, I don't know, Iran or Turkey or like South Korea or North Korea, or like China, like who knows? Yeah. At this point, Mexico and Canada might even like not allow their athletes to come compete. <laughs> <laughs> who knows, man? I, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, of not knowing what's going to happen, what do you think that there's a chance that Greg could go back on some of this stuff and change anything? Or do you feel like at this point it's relatively set in stone? What I mean is like, not anything major, but more like, oh, you know, we decided we're going to take three from the Open from America and, you know, five from Australia and, and we're going to cut half of Africa. It's only going to be one African nation. Like, do you think much will change that? <laughs> only one country there. <laughs> we're going to turn that continent it's into more a country. Than one country. Like, fuck. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, that's a really that's a that's I asked him the exact same thing um, I had a call I call, I had another call with him last week and I asked him I was like so how much of this is like set in stone like how fluid is this because some of this is different from our last call like a couple weeks ago and he uh, he was like yeah we're 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 not you know rigid on this uh, I think I think a lot of it is going to be is going to be uh, fluid, uh, not necessarily in that way. You know, I, I don't really foresee them combining regions anymore. Um, I don't really foresee them trying to parse out spots out of the open uh, based on population or talent or anything like that. I think it's going to be more like eventually they're probably going to have to look at the system and either add more more sanctioned events, start taking the podiums at sanctioned events, um, you know, keep taking not just the national champions, but also like the 20 or 30 best CrossFitters uh, in the open that didn't qualify as a national champion. So I think that's the type of flexibility that they have to have. And when you have a format at the games that surround, like really like the entire fulcrum of the CrossFit games now becomes cutting the field down to 10 you can take as many athletes as you want so eventually i think they're gonna they're gonna be they're gonna be really fluid about about those details mm -hmm. um so I, I don't really know where they're gonna be shifting them to but for sure those are gonna change over time mm. yeah that's that's true last thing i wanted to uh to go over something that would cause cause us a lot of heartache but we said off social media so it's all right um we made a comment about you know the masters athlete being cut and uh certain masters athletes didn't like that but what do you feel the future is for the masters division first of all i can't imagine the grief that you guys must have gotten for 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 like just dashing the hopes of all the age groups just like i'm telling you it wasn't sorry good. old people sorry young people <laughs> like you're done see you later like sorry teenager who just like quit high school and is being, <laughs> being homeschooled <laughs> Sorry, dude. Like you did that for no reason. You're no longer going to be good at this. Um, yeah. Uh, so the age groups will continue to exist. Uh, they they are not changing. The only thing that might change for the age groups is out of the actual online qualifier, they might take less. So I think right now they take like the top twenty in each division. They might take the top ten in each division. Hmm. And the reason behind that is. Uh, again, it's like the spectator aspect of it, right? Imagine right now they have so many, so many masters athletes and teenage athletes that no one ever watches. Like just no one watches unless you're related to the person, you're just never going to watch them. And so I think what ends up happening is if you have uh, like, you know, one heat of individuals on the men's side one heat of individuals on the team side one heat of individuals on the female side that doesn't give you a lot of room like you don't want to just like rotate between them back to back to back to back it's like exhausting for the athletes exhausting for the spectators so i think what they're going to try and do is use the masters and the teens as kind of like um you know they're going to slot in their heats between the individual and team events Okay. to spread it out and give the individuals more time to recover between events, but also put the teens and the masters into the main floor so that everyone gets to watch them. It's like you know, the so kind show. of like, what's that? Like the halftime show. Like the halftime show. Exactly. It's the, it's like, if you want to stick around and watch great, if you want a time to go pee and get another beer, also great. 
So now you have your opportunity to do that. The bit you watch, like when everyone's queuing up for the beers and there's a small screen and everyone's just waiting for their beer, looking up. (laughs) Exactly. What the fuck's happening now? (laughs) It's like, did you guys just see that girl clean jerk 245 pounds? She's 14. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking crazy, man. (laughs) Yeah. So it will continue. I think. I think people, the age groups. Uh, exist. They will continue to compete through the open into the online qualifier and at the games. Like people should just just breathe easy. It's gonna be okay. You know, like we're everything's gonna be fine. Please, like fifty five year old masters athletes, like don't beat me up. Like we're we're okay. Like everything's gonna be okay. Yeah. Nice. Um. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we've uh I think we've shared a lot and uh you've given us a lot of insight. Um. And is there anything that you- the audience you think should know that we haven't covered off yet that we should, should leave them with or anything to expect that you may know? Um, you know, I would, I, I, mean, I don't really, I don't know. There's isn't really any sort of like secret insights that I can provide right now. Um, you know, I, what I would say is just a, allow this to do its, to do its thing, right? Like the, our first blush reaction is going to be like change is bad, Right. And I think this first year, like the 2019 CrossFit Games are going to be particularly weird because not only is it the first time we're doing this, but we also have like a really strange season with the events already kicking off before the Open and a lot of the rules are still in flux. So no one really knows exactly what it's going to look like, but it's growing pains. So just like, just stick with it. If you don't want to do the Open, don't do the Open. It's not a big deal. But if you want to watch or you want to participate, if you want to spectate and be like, you know, part of the experience, you can still do that. Mm-hmm. I think people need to just, you know, remember that CrossFitting is not only to be good at CrossFit. Mm-hmm. You know, you can just be fit and healthy and that's a better thing overall. And just just to chill. I'd say that'd be my main message. Mm-hmm. Like not a specific piece of news, but that would just be my main message. No, that's good. That's and good if your leave. dreams are dashed, what do you think the next easier sport is to become a leader now that CrossFit's kind of closed the door on that? <laughs> is there like some other... Is Grid sport? still around or... Is it what? <laughs> grid. <laughs> so there's some other like internet created sport that we can jump on and very quickly become good at. Uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of CrossFitters moving into bobsled. Mm-hmm. So if you're big and strong and really fast, but don't like rowing for long periods of time or running... Uh, but would prefer like sprinting and lifting heavy weights. Bobsled is a really good option. Um, that actually or, good one of our uh, members, oh, sorry, one of our coaches has like literally has never done bobsled, and I believe she's already in the national team. Oh wow! I'm, I'm yeah. not joking. Yeah, they, that's a real like, thing. Back squat, power clean, and you push this thing, and they're like, "Yep, you're in." <laughs> that's <laughs> fantastic! I from. love it. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, and then you have an opportunity to go to the Olympics. Like that's a real yeah. thing. That's really cool. Um, or jujitsu. I, I mean, I know a lot of people have started doing jujitsu. I think, I think, uh, BJJ is a good, a good transfer. Nice. Yeah. So. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, for everyone listening, if you, uh, didn't know Armin's basically on a rampage, just kind of reporting on everything possible as he sends his minions out and to, uh, to find out what's going on in the world of CrossFit. So you do that mainly through your YouTube channel. It's obviously the best place for people to, uh, to catch up on the news. What is the name of the YouTube and what's some other places we can go to get your info? Yes. So I, I've been using the name uh, Armin Hammer TV, uh, A R M E N Hammer TV, all one word, and you can just find me everywhere with that. Um, YouTube is probably the best place. Uh, Instagram, I've started putting up some uh, sort of like curated versions of my YouTube videos, like sixty second or less versions of my YouTube videos onto onto Instagram. Um, you know, Facebook, I have content on there. If you have like iTunes or uh, Google Play or whatever, you can find my podcasts under that name as well. So there's just a whole, there's a whole lot of places and they all use the same name. So just the Arm and Hammer TV. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, you probably, if you, I mean, if you've even searched CrossFit on YouTube once, mm. he's going to show up in your trending. He's the guy with the mullet. And that's the, uh, <laughs> and the outrageous titles. So <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, for those of you listening, who can't see him right now. That's, um, that's the, yeah, yeah. it's the, it's the mullet and it's, and it's my rainbow pinata behind me. It's bone or the rainbow pinata. Yeah. That was sent to him by Greg Glassman and it has everything, <laughs> everything that's going to happen in the next season. And he's like, Armin, don't break it open until I tell you. And then I'll just be yeah. like, CrossFit news. See what he needs. Just flooding. <laughs> that's so good. I love it. To- I love it. 
He's going through. He's like, "Oh my god, my friends is on steroids. Oh my god, they're getting rid of the, the games." <laughs> oh, man, I said, "Don't open it." <laughs> uh, all right, I think that's a good Pandora's place to leave. Uh, awesome, Armour. Thanks so much for being on again. Uh, we appreciate your time. Of course, man. Thank you. I, I love coming on. Uh, I feel like we could talk for like another like three hours. Like I could talk about this all day long. It's pumped. It, it fires me up. So I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.